recording. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, and oh, I'm sorry. Well, wait, let me get into the. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. I see some new faces today. Uh, I'm just delighted to see each and every one of you. Um, we have an exciting presentation prepared for you today. Uh, but before we go into our presentation, what I will do is, um, one, I want to ask if any of you are having problems with doing the quiz that comes after um, the presentation. What I'd like to do is I'd like to go over that with all of you. If you could stick around a little bit this afternoon, we'll go over that. Because um, I don't want you to get stuck and I don't want you to see it as something that's bogs you down or tie you down. So I want you to enjoy learning. I want you to be able to go through the questions. I want you to be able to ask questions. So if you have questions for us, I want you to feel free to reach out and ask us. It's, this is all about enjoying information. And the more you enjoy the information, the more likely you are to use this information. And I want you to use it. I don't want you to just store it and, and stack it up and say, well, I learned this. I want you to use it in everyday life because I want you to understand something. Research is totally responsible for our lives. And let me tell you how. Kellogg's cornflakes, guess how they became the cornflakes on the shelf? Research. Packaging of our meat. Guess how they decided what packages to put them in, how to put the meat in those packages. Research, clothing, what will go down the runway and what will sell this year? You know what did it? Research. So our lives are totally surrounded by research. And I want you to enjoy this opportunity to ask questions about research that you wouldn't normally ask. So enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. But before I go any further, before I talk anymore, I would like to introduce you to our speaker this afternoon. Today, we're going to have quantitative and qualitative approaches to research. This is just an introduction to research methods. And I think it's very, very important to understand research methods. So how did they decide to make cornflakes? Cheerios, how did they decide, how did they come up with the idea to make Quaker oats? Okay, they didn't shoot them out of a cannon like the old commercials. They didn't do it, okay? How do they decide to make toilet paper? Because you know, some of the toilet paper you put in the toilet will block that toilet up and you will have tons of issues. So all of this is research, research. Cosmetics, when you look at uh, mascara for the eyes, research. If they use the wrong type of chemicals, or the wrong type of dyes for the, for the eye mascara, guess what? It doesn't work or you get lead poisoning. So makeup, all of that is research. And you know, just, we're not gonna make it complicated. We have to keep it simple. Okay, now with that said, what I'd like to do is introduce you to Ms. Jacqueline Vera. She has a master's in public health. She manages the day-to-day -day operations for the patient reported outcomes, community engagement, and language core facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. As a native Afro-Latina New Yorker who grew up in Hell's Kitchen, she obtained her undergraduate degree at Hunter College with a major in sociology. She attended uh, the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy with a concentration in community health education and specialized in maternal child reproductive and sexual health. She is fluent in Spanish and engages the Latinx community via relevant public health projects where she has conducted qualitative analysis. So she's, come, she's talking about her experiences. Ms. Vera is committed to working on projects that seek to engage diverse populations for improvement of healthcare programs and services. She is dedicated to serving her community and is passionate about her work. 
She enjoys traveling, hiking, and looks forward to running the New York City Marathon when it comes up. <laughs> so the next voice you're going to hear is Miss Jacqueline Vera. Thanks, Lula May, uh, for that introduction. And yeah, I was supposed to run it last year, but because of the pandemic, it got canceled. So I'll be doing it in November next month. So oh, I'm okay. uh, so keeping that, my fingers crossed. Kind of a blast. So <laughs> we'll know that you're down late. Yeah. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thanks. Um, thank you. Um, hi, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Vera, um, and today I'll be presenting on qualitative research and clinical trials. Um, so before we get started, I'm just gonna uh, pull up my screen and do a share screen. Just bear with me one moment. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. So um, I think uh, Lula made it a great job at my for my introduction, um, but I quickly just want to recap um, and really focus on what ProCell does. Um, so I work at a core at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, um, where we provide um, support to investigators across the institution who are seeking to use various research methods. And so identification of scales or data collection and analysis, um, that's the primary focus of our work. Um, but we really, really are working hard to engage diverse populations, right? Because right now we have a lot of research um, and understand uh, the population, mostly white population and we don't have enough uh, research to understand diverse communities. So Black, Latino, Asian, you know, that's where we really want to focus and engage more minorities in our clinical trials or our studies um, with a focus around cancer. Um, so that is the core that I work with. Uh, we fall under the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences um, and like Lula May mentioned earlier, I just manage the day-to-day -day operations uh, for that core facility. Um, so it's really something that we're excited about and really kind of connecting and engaging with the really diverse communities here in New York specifically. Um, so I'll give you an example actually of how we do or are trying to engage these communities. Uh, let's say we recruit participants from a specific you know, demographic uh, let's say it's Latino, and we have an existing questionnaire that's in English, um, but they don't speak English. So what we do is we translate that document to Spanish and make sure that it's understandable for them in order for us to collect that information from them, right? We want to make sure that we're using the correct uh, language for this target population. Um, and quickly, I obtained my, um, my master's in public health at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, and I was born and raised here in New York. But um, I really would like to quickly go around and see if uh, we could introduce each other or if you could introduce yourselves. And, and what I'd like to ask you in your introduction is, have you ever participated in a focus group or have you ever been interviewed on your thoughts or feelings about a treatment or let's say a program or a service, um, particularly in a healthcare setting? Um, so maybe, um, I don't know, we can start with, uh, I think I see, um, let's go with Sandra Reyes. In case you're speaking, Sandra, your microphone is muted. Maybe she might be having some technical difficulties. We'll get back to her. How about um, oh, Jose? We can also give like an intro on Sandra too. Oh, okay. Because oh, okay. she works, she's a close community partner. Sandra is, she runs a food pantry up in the South Bronx. 
um, it is, it's instrumental in feeding. I, I won't say hundreds, I'll say thousands, really, really uh, thousands of people every week. She uh, also provides clothing for them, uh, for the community, because the community is, is very much in need of a lot of support. So through her food pantry, Patsco, um, Sandra provides food, she provides clothing, she give, provides coats no, during, awesome. the, during the beginning of the winter. And just like Agnes just said, she supports the community through our naloxone program where she gives out naloxone kits to the people in the community. Um, and her, her people, her group, um, is working on becoming, developing their expertise in teaching about naloxone. So Sandra is very instrumental in doing so many things uh, for the community. And Sandra, years, several years ago, she received a grant from uh, Wild Cornell Clinical Translational Science Center to do a research project. So when, whenever she gets, and she's able to talk about her research project, I will, she will tell you more about it. But Sandra has been a very, very good and faithful uh, communicator and faithful researcher in the community. And she's been such a great person partnering with the community in so many, many ways. She also does a toy drive. Yeah. We've also helped her with. So Amazing. And a back to school drive. So when it comes to community and research, Sandra is the person. She's the go-to person for that. Yeah. That's amazing work, thanks. Um, yeah, let's just, uh, if you guys wanna jump in, I think I mentioned Jose. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Hello. Jose Mesquita, I, uh, I haven't participated in any research, clinical research. Uh, okay. I, I do, I'm trying to do research where I work, you know, regular research about product development and mm -hmm. processes. Um, have I been interviewed about my thoughts on not really? Okay. Uh, my father did go through uh, some uh, therapy for cancer, for leukemia. Mm -hmm. And he did, but I think he, he did take some drugs that were in, you know, in the clinical trial. I don't think he was a participant of a clinical trial at all. Okay. But, um, I'm looking forward to the class and learning Great. more about it. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> I do. Uh, I know Sandra, so. Oh, okay. Uh, as, uh, from time to time, I go and help out with the, with the program. That's great. Thank you. Okay. How about Michael? I have done each one of those in the past, and um, I think they're good. At those times, I really wasn't too focused on all of the details of the processes. It was a nice way of uh, getting $400 in my pocket and things of that nature. But uh, <laughs> but I'm definitely pro, pro research in terms of participation and things of that nature. And I've done, like you said, ones where they pay for your thoughts, as mm -hmm. well as draw blood. I participated in it and will continue to do it as well. That's awesome. Thank you, Michael. Okay, anybody else want to chime in? Okay, um, if we don't have anyone else, uh, I'll just move forward. Um, okay, so what is qualitative research? So qualitative research methods are used to understand people's beliefs, experiences, attitudes, behaviors, and interactions. And it generates non-numerical data, right? That's the key, it's non-numerical. So this means that the patient and or study participant's voice becomes the data. Non-numerical data means that the participant's voice, their words, is the data. That's the big difference there. So in other words, um, we're talking about open-ended data, right? Like a conversation is could be open-ended, a story, a narrative, 
um, and it's understanding the participants experience beyond, let's say, a survey, right? Like in a survey, we're capturing very specific um, kind of numbered items from a scale of one to 10. I'm sure a lot of you have seen those and you answer one. That's the difference with qualitative data. It's going beyond that. Okay, well, how did you feel about this? <laughs> what was your experience? Um, that's, that's qualitative research. Um, and here, this is a really cute illustration that I really enjoy showing, but um, why is qualitative research important? So these are the two different examples, which is you know, what I just kind of broke down between uh, the differences between quantitative methods and qualitative methods. Um, so the researcher using quantitative methods here is interested in how many people um, took the free ice cream. And then in the second one, you could see that the researcher is using um, qualitative methods to want to know what people felt and why. This method provides like the context, right, to observed um, phenomena and grounded in the participants' own words and experiences. So here you could see, why did you, oh no, what did you uh, feel when you saw the free ice cream? Uh, I was excited, a little scared. And why was that? So like the question following questions uh, is known as probing in qualitative methods, we're probing for more information to get you to share that experience that you had, the thoughts that you had and the feelings around that. So why is qualitative research useful in the medical field? Historically, the medical field is known for developing new drugs and interventions and you know, then they capture that data to understand the side effects and the outcomes, right, of the specific drug. And then they analyze the results. Like that's a whole process. But most of this research in the past didn't include the voice of the participant without understanding like the social context. Um, very little is known about, you know, how the patient feels during the process. Like you know, this chemo, how did you feel besides literally throwing up? You know, I felt sad, I felt depressed, um, or maybe another type of drug. Well, it actually gave me energy and I felt happy. Um, so that's, you know, the difference is there. So why should we care about that, right? Can anyone take a guess? Give it a stab. So I'll share an example. Um, did I just hear someone get unmuted? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do we uh, care about what people feel? Yeah. During research? Uh-huh. Uh, obviously, because if you know how they feel, then you may want to do something about it to make them feel better, if they're not, and mm -hmm. to keep them you know, coming. So you can mm -hmm. have more people participate. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so without understanding the patient's attitudes and beliefs, you know, sometimes researchers, um, they, can, they can, you know, develop, they can risk developing an intervention that's not working or that's not useful to the patient. Um, and it could sometimes even be harmful to the patient, right? So it's not, it's really understanding uh, beyond the survey and beyond uh, what we could physically see. It's, we, we wanna make sure that, you know, we're doing right by the patient and doing no harm. Um, uh, so that's really why qualitative research is very important in the medical field. And today, you know, medicine over the years has become more interested in patients' voice and their experience. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of health professionals that, that want to uh, have that patient perspective, which is great. I have some comments in the chat um, before oh, someone yes. said that in layman language, I'd say quantity and quality. And then mm -hmm. uh, to these, um, what you just were speaking about, Michael said to attempt to attempt to release anxiety, minimize stress and depression. And Sandra also said alleviate frustration of a known get some synchro or some control okay 
Yes, those are all really good points. Actually, sorry, I didn't notice these uh, comments in the chat, but thanks for that, um, Agnes. No worries. Um, yeah, for everyone, um, thanks for sharing those um, really important facts. Uh, that that that's a very good point, and and yes, we want to make sure it's not adding more uh, than we want um, and, and harming, harming the patient through anxiety um, or stress, which then could also potentially lead to other um, health issues. Um, so moving along, um, there are different types of clinical trials, right? Um, and today I'm really gonna focus on three, which is the three that you see here highlighted in red, but I'll give you examples of the others and really just a really quick kind of summary. So clinical trials are types of research studies and qualitative research can support all of these, right? Um, so here's a little background. The first one is um, treatment research. So that really means it generally involves an intervention such as a medication, a psychotherapy or new devices um, or new approaches to surgery or radiation therapy. The second one is screening research, which really aims to find the best way to detect certain disorders or health conditions. Um, the third one is implementation research, and that really involves program planning using best practices, right, informed by research findings and other evidence-based practice for program evaluation um, and or solutions. And uh, prevention research looks at better ways to prevent disorders from developing or returning. And uh, different kinds of prevention research may study medicines, vitamins, vaccines, or lifestyle changes. Those are types of prevention uh, research. And quality of life research explores ways to improve comfort and the quality of life for an individual with a chronic illness. And then lastly, we have genetics, which, is, uh, which aims to improve the prediction of disorders by identifying and understanding like a person's genes and uh, how the illnesses may be related to them. Okay. So context, right? So how does qualitative research support clinical trials? Well, it adds context, right? It provides and adds context. It adds meaning and insight for a particular circumstance, event, thought, idea, statement, et cetera. Um, it really helps generate like in-depth insight into how a patient feels and what they think, right? Which is what I've been talking about. Um, so, you know, using qualitative research will uncover things that like a researcher wouldn't be able to do in a lab or in an office, in a doctor's office. Um, they wouldn't be able to easily get to that information. Um, so it really helps us to understand behaviors in a, in a person's natural setting, right? So in other words, in our day-to-day -day life, um, this is something, like I said, you can't do at, an, at a lab or a, in a doctor's office. So they want to understand um, uncovering, you know, and, and understanding our day-to-day -day in our homes, in our commute during, you know, to and from work in our neighborhoods, uh, understanding more about our culture and the language and all of those things. Um, so, you know, it is the something, the treatment, intervention, medication, whatever it is, is it being used how it was intended to, right? So context brings a lot of information to really understand if, uh, you know, the program or the service or the intervention, right, is doing what it's supposed to do. So examples of qualitative research. Um, here, I'll start with our first example, which is treatment research. Um, qualitative research can help develop questionnaires um, through cognitive interviews. So this is an example uh, where it's a survey, um, a scale, um, a depression scale, and we want to measure, you know, how often during the past weeks have uh, were you bothered by 
uh, little interest or pleasure in doing things. Zero to you know one several days more than more than the days nearly every day. So you can see you you can um, kind of just identify how you're feeling based on these questions that they're asking. Um, so in this example, right the the researcher wants to understand um, or make sure that you understand, sorry, that you understand this scale, this questionnaire in front of you. And again, uh, you know, it's getting at the comprehension and the retrieval um, of these questions so that we could understand and really get to the aim of understanding depression, right? Um, so really cognitive interviews is the researcher will have the participant um, kind of go through and answer all of the questions in the questionnaire. And, um, and then they'll ask you, why did you, you know, under, what, what did you understand from answering the questions? What does it mean to you? Um, does this term mean anything to you, right? And really, let's say the investigator, I'm going to just use an example, uh, wanted to recruit participants from, I'm going to say Jackson Heights in Queens. And uh, we know there are a lot of Spanish speaking um, people in Jackson Heights. Um, and they want to understand uh, depression among this population, right? Like Latinos. Um, and, and personally, like in my own family, like the word depression isn't really used. Um, they use a word called aburrida, which means bored or triste, right? Um, or which means sad. Um, they don't really use the word, the accurate word, deprimida. So let's say if they had the translation of depression, deprimida, in the questionnaire, that's not a really common word that, you know, uh, my, my family would use. So we wanna make sure that we think about the target language and non-English speaking participants um, that would use the word depression and make sure that, you know, is this a common word for them? Does it exist? Um, in some cultures, there are certain words that don't exist in the direct translation from the English. Um, so the researcher here in this example, they'll continue with more and more questions until they get you know, the feedback, hey, this, per, this population, we see that there's a theme here. This is the more common word for them. So if we're gonna recruit from this um, community, let's use this word because as we see in our research through the cognitive interviews, they were able to identify the language that is most, you know, uh, common for them uh, that's appropriate in their culture, their choice of word and language. And um, that's really how we develop uh, questionnaires in, in non-English, you know, uh, communities. And I, I think that, uh, oh, I think I have a, a comment here. He gets denial, anger, embarrassment, insult. Correct. Right. So, you know, uh, that, that could also have another term and meaning for, uh, for certain cultures as well. Um, so what, what other word could we use that could better help, um, uh, help them understand what we mean without it feeling like it's such a heavy word um, or a word that's uh, accepted in their culture? Um, I did quantitative depression, just young research. Nurse really surprised the results. Yeah, thanks, Sandra, for sharing that. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting, <laughs> um, definitely. Um, so, right, so, you know, here the, the, the researcher can ask, how comfortable do you feel with answering this question over a phone? How easy um, or difficult was it to select an answer from the options provided? Uh, why did you select that option in comparison to others? Why, why, why? We, we want to make sure that we develop the um, a questionnaire that's most appropriate um, for this uh, certain demographic. Um, so that's an example of uh, treatment research. So in the next slide, um, this is screening research. Um, let me get to the chat really quick. My biggest finding was associated weakness with depression. 
Yep. <laughs> definitely. Those um, definitely do go hand in hand. Um, so thanks for sharing that again, Sandra. Um, screening research. Uh, that's our second example, which aims um, to really find the best ways to detect certain disorders or health conditions. So here, let's say the qualitative researcher, um, they can help in the recruitment and in the enrollment of participants, right, of, for study participants. Uh, and in here, I have these two posters and it, let's say it's uh, the recruitment, the study is for a smoking cessation program or lung cancer screening program. Um, the team and the researcher, they will conduct a focus group to ensure the accurate representation of the sample, depending on the demographics um, and efficient recruitment methods determine the best possible outcome, right? For, for this uh, target population. So let's say uh, the target population was black um, and Latino communities, and we wanna focus on recruiting in neighborhoods like uh, let's say the Bronx, Central Harlem, Spanish Harlem, um, you know, we're going to present these ads, these two that I have here. Um, in the focus group, uh, we would pretty much ask them, like, what do you think? And was there any information that you didn't understand? Um, did this resonate with you? Or do you see themselves in this campaign ad, right? Uh, was it too much information? Too little? Was there too much medical jargon? Um, how would you feel about this kind of uh, ad in a bodega in the community or in a health clinic, in a community health clinic or at a church? Uh, would you prefer brochures? Would that be something that would, you, know, you would be more interested in and engage you? Um, was the commercial or this ad, let's say we had it in Spanish, um, was it translated well? Did it speak to you? Did it speak to you and your culture? Um, the images, like all of these things um, would be part of the focus group because we wanna make sure that before we set out to really uh, recruit in this community, we're using uh, uh, materials that are appropriate and culturally sensitive and all those things, right? Um, and that also that would capture their attention. Um, and that's ultimately what we want is have uh, the community be interested and engage in, in the research studies. So here is another example, um, implementation research, which is a program planning and uh, qualitative research can help in design of this uh, through observations and in in-depth interviews, right? So um, here, the researcher wants to know how they can best design a program. Uh, what are the barriers? And program evaluation includes what did the participants like or didn't like about the intervention? Why did they react in the way that they did? It may also include observations of the community, uh, right? Identifying the locations um, to overcome potential barriers to implementation and promote uptake of an intervention, right? Um, so qualitative research really generates in-depth insight into trial recruitment barriers. This is an example. Um, it helps to understand the acceptability and feasibility of interventions being tested. And it also helps improve uh, the trial conduct. Um, we can help in changes into procedures such as methods of participant recruitment. Um, and it looks at the background, the, the setting to ensure the relevance to the program to identify like social, cultural, health, economic or political factors that might affect um, uptake or interest, right? Um, so here in this example, uh, um, I have pictures uh, from my own project that I did for my capstone um, in grad school. And this is looking at the social environmental factors and how they 
predict HPV vaccine uptake in, in an ongoing like multicultural, uh, sorry, multi-site study. Uh, this was a study that was done in Texas and Chicago and here in New York City. Um, so I used qualitative research to identify barriers to study participation among Mexican immigrants, which was the focus of this study. And uh, it took place at the Mexican consulate in El Paso, Texas, which is where I went for this. So I observed, um, I conducted in-depth interviews in Spanish and I made field, uh, field observations uh, to understand really the social, uh, as I said, you know, environmental factors and their impacts on the recruitment of participants for this specific study, which was HPV vaccines. Um, so here, when I visited during the summer of 2019, um, which was at a time where, uh, you know, it was the peak of the Trump administration, um, uh, where it was a lot of intensified uh, anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, and so the research uh, really, while conducting the, the in-depth interviews in the consulate, I identified, um, the research helped me identify uh, and documented multiple barriers to accessing healthcare, particularly interest in this stu uh, HPV study. Um, you know, it, it really when I spoke and I and and asked the partic potential participants and even staff that worked there, you know, uh, my inter part of the interviews was, what do you think would be a barrier for you know, how does the barrier present? Here for you, and you know, they told me the fear of deportation. Um, uh, I, 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 I feel like you know, stepping into these locations, I, I, it reminds me that I can be deported. Um, here's an example of uh, the brochures on the table where it says in Spanish, "Si, si te detienen," if you get detained, like, and and it was everywhere. Um, so you can imagine going to a consulate. And you have all these very kind of uh, uh, messages around, you know, what to do if you get detained, ICE, and all of this. What are you going to feel about being interested in, you know, participating in this study that's uh, that, that that's set up <laughs> nearby? Um, I think, uh, well, from my my research, they had much more other concerns. Uh, that really uh, affected their and impacted their choice to want to um, participate in a study. You know, part of that includes um, giving their information. They think that if I disclose my name and my phone number, um, they're going to find me and I'm going to get deported. So it really prevented family from seeking medical help. Um, and that was the fear that was that that they were expressing. Um, so, you know, um, I use direct observation of the environment. That This is an example. You could see uh, even the border in, in El Paso, uh, Texas, um, and you could see the messages, the brochures there. Um, I did the uh, in-depth interviews at the consulate, and, you know, this is the this is what kind of helped me inform my research, um, where then I collected that and I did the analysis and presented the, the project. Um, so moving along, uh, qualitative data collection, right? Um, so the most common methods used in clinical trials are the ones we just covered, which are in-depth interviews, focus groups, cognitive interviews, and observations. So part of the data collection is uh, the qualitative data analysis. Um, and, you know, we collect the data through what I just said, through the interviews, focus groups, and all of that. So what happens with all of this data that we collect? Um, the researcher and coding team applies codes to the data set, which involves the reading of the transcripts, identifying, selecting, and applying the codes. Um, so the interviews are transcripts, right? The observations become notes that then you would, you know, kind of identify and select and apply 
codes that you identify that have a theme. So here I'll show you, sorry. Um, <clears throat> coding is a process of organizing the data uh, to see connections and identifying common themes. And this is an example of how the data gets organized. So from those big transcripts, you would organize them in this very kind of, you know, uh, uh, simple <laughs> and uh, broken down uh, kind of format where you'll understand and you could see more clearly what the, the themes are across all the interviews or all the different observations from the different settings that you, you're going to, uh, which makes it a lot more easier to understand and analyze. So finally, um, this is uh, just kind of a wrap up here. Uh, why is qualitative research important in clinical trials? Researchers want to hear the patient narrative. Um, it improves interventions, health programs, and initiatives. Um, it gives a voice to patient experience. Patient stories are very valuable and they matter. It inspires and illustrates from the patient perspective. It identifies the norms, the patterns, and the trends. And it provides nuance, right, to very complex issues or problems uh, by, you know, interpreting and understanding uh, through their, their, their voice. Um, and so simply, it just strengthens clinical trials by enhancing, you know, participant involvement through this process. So, um, uh, qualitative research is, is really fun. Um, I really have met a lot of interesting people um, and sharing their experience. And yeah, it's something that I think is important for um, uh, minority communities, uh, people of color um, in my own family. You know, I, I try to like push them like, you know, uh, go uh, and, and, and get the <laughs> $20, right? Or something, but it, it, it's, really providing just such a strong voice so that, you know, it could be used to really help the broader uh, community of uh, different cultures. Um, so that is why qualitative research is really important in clinical trials. And um, I hope you learned something here today uh, through my presentation. And I'm just gonna give, I guess, a few moments for questions if anyone has any. Thank you. How do you introduce, I'm thinking about your, your, your time spent in El Paso and, and the, the study and, and in the midst of that environment, who, mm, how do you extract a, a health issue out of a, 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 a group that's in crisis, that does have other priorities, that has human rights issues on its plate, that they may have other diseases, including um, sickle cell or or lupus, you know, how do you extract that need for a survey or study in the midst of a crisis? How does that, how does that, I mean, it sounds so intrusive and, and sensitive. So um, at the consulate, uh, they, they do have a lot of support and resources that are present there for anyone who is interested. So it's not something that feels very, uh, it, like let's say in your face. It's really simple. They have the table set up um, and it's not, it wasn't just this study uh, in terms of HPV vaccines, but it was, hey, have you checked your cholesterol today? Here, uh, you can do this really quickly if you'd like. Um, and they have the table set up and people walk up to them if they're interested. This isn't something that, you know, they feel pressured or obligated to do. So um, it's really a by choice that um, uh, someone going to the Mexican consulate would see that and say, you know what, maybe I should do this or I'm interested. 
Um, so it really wasn't anything that felt intrusive. We were just there in case um, they they were interested. Okay. Does that answer your question, Deborah? It, it does. It, it because you you know we're looking at clinical studies and. I, I guess I envision a different environment. This see, this was walking into the embassy rather than being in one of the the, the grazing posts for, that held people um, undocumented people. So I guess this is more voluntary people who were settled in the community. Yeah, I mean the consulate is not. Um, it doesn't only uh, you know provide resources for undocumented people. Uh, it, it's a place where. They could renew potentially their pa or ask or inquire okay. about their passport for someone uh, or ask about just questions around their family and family members abroad. Um, so there's definitely a lot of resources and help that the consulate provides um, for sure. And, and, and some of the, those resources and information education is also available if they were interested there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question. Uh, when you choose a demographic, uh, do you have like a quota that you need to meet to conduct the study or you just, you know, whoever comes in, that's it, or you target a specific group? Yeah, we, they do, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, decide on the number of participants that's going to be necessary in order to have enough data, right? Like it, it's not random where, oh, we'll be lucky if we have two people, um, let's use our research on that. That's not sufficient enough for it to become uh, rich, uh, valuable data. So definitely depending on, you know, uh, previous studies that had been done or information that's available uh, from previous researchers, uh, the, the team and the investigator would identify the number that would be accurate for uh, recruitment and where they would be happy to, you know, end um, after that certain number is met. Thank you. So I'm curious, what was the observation of those who walk past the table? Because this is, we're talking about people with religious views and cultural perceptions? Yeah, sure. Um, my, in my observation, um, people, they did not engage sometimes and others were curious. Um, and, and that's really what I observed uh, during my time there. Mm -hmm. No, no, reach, no outreach for help. No, no further questions from them. May I see a doctor or anything else was, was um, observed. No one acted on that. So in terms of observation, part of what the researcher does is we really maintain a kind of, a, we're there to observe the environment and we're not really engaged in conversation. We just kind of observe and we tr really try to not uh, uh, be, be in a, a, affect any of the behavior. So we want to try and stay in the background as much as possible. Um, so during the observation, I was not, um, particularly listening to or engaging in the discussions that were happening. I was observing the environment, the way the people, you know, where they moved towards to, um, and and the messaging in the space itself that that's part of what we you know def define under observation. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. But that's a great question, Deborah. Thanks. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think if not, um, you can always send an email uh, or follow up with Agnes, right? And I'd be more than happy to get back to that question. Awesome. Thank you, Jacqueline, Thank for that you. wonderful presentation. Um, Lula will introduce tomorrow, Crowder. Yes, I will. Let me get my <laughs> notes.
<laughs> I thank you, Jacqueline, because you, you did a great job. You really um, made us think about research in a different way, because when we think about research, we always think about numbers, and we don't think about feelings, emotions, places, and people. So I thank you very much for your very informative presentation. Thank you. That's a hard kind of research. It's difficult. Wow. And I have to apologize to all of you. Because my office is sort of across <laughs> from Agnes, and my, my computer it doesn't work very well. Um, now, our next presenter is Ms. Tamara Crowder. She has a master's in science and a bachelor's in science. She's worked at Weill Cornell Clinical Translational Science Center Core Lab. She's the core laboratory supervisor since 2018 here at Cornell. She assists clinicians and junior investigators in implementing their research projects while she and her staff continues to maintain the multifaceted CTSC laboratory here as a New York State CLIA certified lab. And you'll ask her more about that. Prior to that, she served for seven years as a lab supervisor at Columbia University clinical flow cytometry laboratory, providing immunophenotyping diagnostics to New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia. She was the recipient of Dr. Nathan Lane Award for Clinical and Educational Excellence in 2011, a New York State Certified Clinical Laboratory Technician since 2009, Ms. Tamara has over 20 years of laboratory experience in research and clinical labs. At Einstein College of Medicine, she completed an MS in biochemistry with a research focus on enzyme mechanics. She also holds a BS biology from Haverford College. I thank you so much, Ms. Crowder, for taking time for your busy schedule to come talk with us today. So I thank you and I welcome you. The next thank voice you, that you Linda. hear will be Ms. Tamara Crowder. Okay, you want me to start? Hello? Yeah, you can share your screen. Okay. I just wanted to make sure uh, you guys can hear it. I had trouble with my real computer, but now I'm using my laptop, so hopefully that works. So thank you for the introduction and thank you, Jacqueline Vera. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about quantitative research methods. But first, we're going to start with a little video that Agnes and I made about the lab, just because most people don't have experience in a lab setting. So it gives you an idea of what we do at the CTSC lab. Can you guys hear it? It's a little low. Could you put the okay. volume up? Yeah, let me see if I can just run it. This is my first time doing a video on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you did it so well. Oh, 
Oh yeah, we're still not able to hear. I'm getting the comments in. Oh, you can't hear? I mean, it's uh, really low. Because I have the volume on the video turned up all the way. Um, do you video. have a way of sharing it, Agnes? Maybe yeah, let me try. Let me try. It. Sorry about that, guys. No, no worries. You can write the volume for everybody to raise their own volume. Computer volume. Yeah, we go. Yeah, I'm gonna try and share my screen. Okay, do you see the, the slides? Yeah, I see it. Yes.
So she handles your sample and processes it until it's ready for analysis. Okay. Thank you, Agnes. I hope that was visible. If not, perhaps it will be clearer in the. Um... Yeah, maybe I could uh, share the slides so everyone could take a look at them at their own time and hear yeah. the video. I think it'd be clearer hearing from me. Yeah, uh, I could yeah. Own device. So I'll, I'll share the slides after class. Okay. All Good, right, thanks. so I will continue with the other one. Okay, so the first thing is just a brief description of the differences between qualitative and quantitative research. So quantitative research, which Jacqueline was talking about, is expressed by numbers and graphs. It's used to test or confirm theories and assumptions. This type of, I'm sorry, qualitative research, which Jackie was talking about, is expressed in words. It's used to understand concepts, thoughts, or experiences. This type of research enables you to gather in-depth insights on topics that are not well understood. Common qualitative methods include interviews with open-ended questions, observations described in words, and literature reviews that explore concepts and theories. And now I'm going to talk more about quantitative research, which is the numbers and um, a little bit more with you would expect from traditional science, but it doesn't give as big of a picture as uh, qualitative research does. So quantitative data is expressed in numbers and graphs. It's used to test or confirm theories and assumptions. This type of research can be used to establish generalizable facts about a topic. Common quantitative methods include experiments, observations reported as numbers, and surveys with closed-ended questions, like yes or no questions, as opposed to where the responder can give a more um, detailed answer. In this presentation, I'm gonna give a little mini scenario with COVID-19 because I feel like it's easier to have a concrete example to follow. So in quantitative research, scientific questions are addressed with numerical analysis using computational techniques. The researcher is interested in the relationship of numerical data and related events. So for example, in New York City, the COVID-19 positivity rate differs among age groups. And we're gonna use that as an example to look at quantitative research. The working hypothesis that we're gonna start out with is that older adults have an increased COVID-19 positivity rate because they're more susceptible to the disease. So quantitative research is defined by five characteristics, it's objective with clearly defined questions, standardized tools, hard data, and it's repeatable. So what does it mean to be objective? It means that the research is not influenced by personal feelings or opinions. So in this scenario, positivity is determined by an established laboratory test. Results are either positive or negative as determined by the presence of COVID-19 viral particles in the respiratory system. So the subject's feelings or opinion on viral exposure do not affect the test results. So even if the subject felt like he or she had COVID-19, you're not going to use that aspect in this particular example. You would just use the data from the laboratory test. The next characteristic is that there's clearly defined questions. Clear questions are not ambiguous or open to more than one interpretation. For example, what is the subject's age? Is there COVID-19 present in the respiratory system? And what does the laboratory test results show? 
Additionally, we use standardized tools to measure the data. So standardized tools have undergone rigorous testing and have been approved for use by the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Lab tests are standardized by the manufacturer through a validation process. The validation process proves the accuracy of the test. In this scenario, a COVID rapid PCR test is used to determine COVID-19 positivity. So what is it the validation process mean? It's a method of determining accuracy and repeatability, and it defines the specificity and sensitivity of this test. What is specificity and sensitivity? Specificity is the extent to which a diagnostic test is specific for a particular condition. So in this example, the COVID-19 test must show positivity only for COVID-19, not for other respiratory infections like the swine flu. Sensitivity is the test ability to correctly detect ill patients who do have the condition. In this example, they have to establish a minimum amount of COVID-19 particles that can be detected by the test. So is there a possibility that someone can test negative and then positive a day or two later? Of course, because the virus is rapidly replicating in the person, but the manufacturer determines a minimum that they define as the minimum detectable amount. Another characteristic is that there's hard data. So hard data is quantitative data in the forms of numbers or graphs. In contrast, qualitative data, soft data, can be defined by opinions, thoughts, and ideas. So COVID-19 lab results are an example of hard data. It's either positive or negative. The last characteristic is that the results are repeatable. So what does it mean to be repeatable? A result obtained by an experiment or observational study should be achieved again with a high degree of agreement when the study is replicated with the same methodology by different researchers. So if we do the testing on one person here at Cornell and then somebody else does the same test at Sloan Kettering, we should get the same result. And to ensure that the results are reproducible in that manner, there are standards with known values tested along with the subject samples. So standards are used in testing labs across the country. Everyone using the same methodology uses the same standards. They're commercially available, again, from the manufacturer. If the value and the manufacturer determines an acceptable range, and if you get values outside of that range, then you need to look at your equipment or your reagents and figure out what's going on. You can't report lab results unless um, the standards are within the acceptable range. So this gives us a degree of confidence in the data that we're getting. So how is reproducibility measured? It's measured through precision and accuracy. So precision refers to how close measurements are to each other. Accuracy refers to how close measurements are to the true value. So you can have data that's very precise, but it may not be accurate. So in the picture, you can see that um, low accuracy is far away from the target, but it can still be precise. They can all be near each other, but you're still getting the wrong values. So the goal is to be accurate and precise. So those are the quantitative research characteristics. And now I'm just going to show a couple data points that I grabbed from the New York City website back when the pandemic was raging. So in case anyone's curious, I looked at um, four dates in early, at the beginning of this year and end of 2020, and uh, people with uh, over 75 and between the ages of 18 and 24. And in New York City, it was the case that older adults were more likely to have a be COVID positive than younger adults of those tested. Okay, that's all. Does anyone have any questions? So on a previous speaker, we talked about demographics to make sure that it's repeatable. I mean, so you can't, you need to have the same demographic, same age, gender, race, 
um, to keep it repeatable and tested. So someone from Togo Togo couldn't just come in and take and, and be a part of that, the, 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 the data collected from that person, blood or, or, or saliva. It has to be the same set of demographics for it to be repeatable. Uh oh, the demographics are definitely important to look at. And generally, when we're doing a clinical study, the the investigator or and sometimes it's a pharmaceutical company that's developing, they write a protocol and within for how they're going to test their product. And within that protocol, one of the components is that they need to test a diverse group of people in order to prove to the FDA that their product works. So definitely demographics are important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat. Well, I thank you, Ms. Tamara Crowder. Thank you. I enjoyed your video. It was very yeah. informative. I thank you for your presentation today. And I'm looking forward to the next time you do this presentation. And I'm looking forward to see the, what the students are going to say and do in regards to quantitative research and the numbers. So that the numbers in, in quantitative research are so very important and pivotal. So I thank you, I thank you again. Thank, thank you, Lulu. Yeah. It was fun making the video. <laughs> yeah, we have... that's why you did Next... such a great job, Agnes. I hope other people can see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your next career path as um, as actor, and will be I'll be producer. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! I couldn't see the video. Maybe you could send it. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm gonna send it, and um, please send your feedback also. So on what you thought about that, or if you have any more questions about the lab, also. Um, it was our first time, so. <laughs> All right. Okay, now I'd like to I'd, I'd like just to ask a few a little housekeeping. How are you finding the exams? Are they confusing? Are they are they are you are they losing you? Are they just too cumbersome? What do you think of the exams? And I, I want you to know um, the the I just want you to do the exams um, because it gives me feedback. It lets us know whether we missed the mark or we're on the mark. So I, I'd like you to just take a look at them. Um, if need be, what I can do is I'll go over them with you after the classes or like, for example, um, I can go over with you uh, the ones from series three with uh, Patel Pankaj and Evan O'Donovan. So I'd like to know how many people would like me to go over them with you or would you like to do a Q&A for these uh, questions? Any suggestions? Everyone can't be on mute. What do you mean by q &A? Uh, I'm fine with it. I'm fine the way you're doing it. Uh, oh, OK. OK. All right. I don't know if anybody has any issues. What is okay. the Q&A? Question and answers. Then I know, but how would that be? We do it live or? Um, I mean, like, for example, if uh, on last week's questions, if someone had a question about a question and why was that the answer or why wasn't that the answer, that kind of thing. The quiz is okay. The other material is a killer, but yours are okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Because um, I'm finding people haven't been doing so. I'm just going to encourage you to do them. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask and what I'd like if you the photo voice assignment mm -mm. the photo voice assignment uh I think uh Agnes sent it out today or you sent it out I'm gonna send it out with the video she's yeah. gonna send it out in a little while so if you have any questions about it um send Agnes back an email but I the photo novella or the photo voice is a fun assignment 
It's a, it's a fun assignment and it's a very powerful assignment. Uh, Agnes will put, up, put it up on her screen right now. It's due October 20th, okay? Okay. And what it is, is you take a look I'll read it in a minute. You take a look at what is sticking out in your community. What do you see? So it could be various things. It could be uh, people who are, it's getting cold, uh, people who may not have clothing. I'll give you an example. My younger sister called me and she's a detective for New York Police Department. And she called me and she was so upset because wherever she was walking or driving, there were so many people who were outside in the street in hospital gowns. And she said, oh my gosh, what's going on? Like she saw like two or three people and she said, they're all in hospital gowns. Uh, and she was concerned about it. So if she had, was able to take their pictures from the back or where you couldn't identify the person or maybe just in the middle, so you couldn't say, well, that's Harry or that's George or that's Mary or that's Susan or that's, that's Lulu, you wouldn't be able to tell who it was. You could take the pictures, but you could take pictures of inanimate objects. You could take pictures of the garbage cans. Um, you could take pictures of the fruit boxes. You could take pictures of fruit stands. You could take pictures of uh, whatever hits you, hits your eye. For example, this is a, a photo voice that was done by Dr. Elizabeth Cohen. And photo voice or photo novella is a form of research. And it was defined by Wang and Burroughs in 1997 as a process by which people can identify, represent, and enhance the community health through a specific photographic technique. And basically that technique is taking pictures of those elements from various views at various times. Um, and Photo Voice was designed with an intention to help people who don't usually have a voice in policy to make changes at the policy level. And my example for Photo Voice or Photo Novella is when you look at the picture of George Floyd when he was, when the uh, officer had his foot on his neck, that whole uh, picture went viral. And because of that picture, that video, it changed policy. It changed things that had been taken for granted for years and years and years. So when you think about the power that the community has when we use our voice through photography, through videos. And that is what a photo voice is. And what Dr. Cohen does is she took a picture of her sneakers and she gave us a little example that she liked um, going, she liked walking. And during when the pandemic started, she could not go to her regular places, the, uh, the gym was closed, which she liked to go and the swimming pools were closed. So she decided to walk in her neighborhood, but she was so concerned about the fact that during the COVID, so many people were not wearing their masks. And because they weren't wearing her masks, rather than have a leisurely, comforting, stress reducing walk, she was more stressful after she came back from her walk because there were so many people in her community that were not wearing masks because of so much misinformation. So take a look at Dr. Cohen's example and make your own. Uh, and I'm sure it's gonna be easier than you think. So um, try to have it in by 10, 18. 10, 20. 10, 20. okay, sorry, by mm -hmm. 10, 20. And uh, at that time, uh, what Agnes will do, is she will send them to Dr. Cohen and Dr. Cohen will look at them and look at what your photo voice is saying and help pull it together. Our long-term goal is to put these, all of them 
and to hunt a virtual gallery. Um, we're just having a problem with that because the Hunter Gallery was closed because of COVID. So they're backed up like a year and a half. So I'm trying to look for another site for us to have our art exhibition or exhibit, our art exhibit. Um, and that would be our photo novellas or photo voice. So if you have a question about that, not a problem. Send the questions or concerns to Agnes and we'll get back to you. Thank you so much. If you have a question, let me know. Okay. That will end today's class. Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, I have, I will have the recording, um, if not by today, tomorrow, and then we will work on the questions as well for this week's class. And okay. you're sending the instructions for the photo novella today? Yes, I'll send that with the video. So I guess to get ahead of um, of everything, I'll send the video. And then once I have more material, I'll send it to you um, with the, like the questions. That way it's not delayed um, for a long period of time. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.